Carmen Rodriguez Peralta, Director of the World of Music Concert Series. I want to welcome all of you. We're really happy to have this very interesting lecture recital it's going to be given by my colleague, Rady Bakes, who is now Dr. Rady Bakes. He just completed his doctorate, and his dissertation topic was actually the guitar music of David Hewitt. So he has a lot of interesting things to say about this composer and where he composed and his influences. So we are delighted this is a collaboration between the Concert Series and the Commonwealth Honors Program. Without further ado, please welcome Rayleigh Bates. This was among some of the projects I did there. So um, we're going to kind of go through this guy named David Hewitt. Um, through his life, we're going to learn a little bit about South African music in general, um, how he kind of blended Western classical, rock and roll, blues, that sort of stuff, um, with his homeland of South Africa, um, and his eventual like classical guitar. It's also kind of an ugly word, but his, his classical guitar composition of this sort of stuff. Um, I first found out about this stuff through my duo partner. His name's Carl Straussner. Some of you guys might know him. He himself is South African, um, and he told me about this Dave Hewitt fellow. We started playing some of these pieces, um, and I can guarantee nobody here has heard these. So these are, this is definitely the MCC premiere. It's probably the, it's definitely the Bedford premiere too. So nobody, nobody's heard this stuff. So I figured I might start with two of them. Um, how this program's gonna go, so every time you see a space, I'm gonna start talking. So it's gonna be kind of chunk of playing, chunk of talking, chunk um, I'm going to start with Sunrise and a goalie. So Sunrise is kind of as it sounds. It's like a musical envisioning um, of the sunrise over the savannah in South Africa. It's kind of fitting for this is musician Sunrise. So this is 11 a.m. It's really early for a musician. Um, and a goalie, which literally means the city of gold. And that's Johannesburg, South Africa. That's the biggest, definitely the biggest city in South Africa. It's one of the biggest like, urban areas in the world. Um, and that's kind of where David goes like to. So here we go. Sunrise and Eagle. <laughs>
Okay, sweet. Gives you some sense of the uh, style of writing of this. So choose your words about it. I kind of think of it's like a cross between like an eighties and nineties like pop tune and like an African African song. So it sounds sounds as is like that. Okay, who is this guy? Who is David Hewitt? He's a classical guitarist, so he performed as a soloist throughout South Africa, Europe, and the United States. Um, he performed traditional works for solo classical guitar, um, but he also performed many new works by um, South African composers, so it was a priority for him to, to premiere works by South Africans. Um, he also wrote his own, so he performed and, and recorded his own music. Um, as a composer, he wrote 16 works for solo and duo guitar. 16 of them uh, were written, 12 of them were published. So I guess there's four of them out there um, handwritten. Um, he was a collaborator, so a member of South Africa's premier guitar duo. He was a performer of music by South African composers. Um, he was a recording artist and bandmate. It's worth saying there's really not a lot written or, or um, documented about this guy. Um, he remains, for guitar, kind of a critical figure, certainly in South Africa, um, but even for us. So it's kind of, kind of nice to add to the repertoire of, of guitar that we've got. Okay. He was actually born in Wales in 1947, and a year later, he and his family moved to South Africa, to Johannesburg. Um, he was a musician from a very young age. He began his musical life as a singer and using the guitar as an accompaniment to his singing. So, uh, pretty common. Um, he was a commercial performer and a session musician for the first eight years of his musical career. Um, people my age and older will remember Let Your Fingers Do the Walking Through the Yellow Pages, that jingle. In South Africa, he was the guy that sang it. So it came from the voice of David Hewitt. Um, at the age of 13, he won the first prize at So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star. Uh, contest in South Africa um, with his self-composed rock song, Problem Child. Um, and arriving at his first lesson for South Africa's um, guitarist at university, he was asked to go back to school, so he was told he wasn't good enough. So he practiced, and when he was about 20, he went back to um, the University of Witwatersrand um, in Johannesburg, it's known as Wits University. So he came, went back, went back to school. This is his teacher. I won't go wild about this guy. Um, he's kind of like the Sigilvia of South Africa. So he's a big deal in, in South African guitar, acoustic guitar playing. Um, Fritz Bus, to me, somehow the most guitar name ever. Um, Bus's students include those people, so Timothy Walker, Diedrich Wagner, Simon Winberg, Tessa Ziegler, becomes very important, so she's the first woman to get a, a to enter guitar university, so to enter as a, as a female playing guitar at um, South African University. Um, it's also David Hewitt's dual partner. Um, David Hewitt, obviously, and then George Mathimba was the first black classical guitarist to achieve a diploma from Wits University. Uh, written about Fritz Buss, who's David Hewitt's teacher, um, Deidre Wadner said, it is one of his qualities as a born teacher that Fritz Buss encourages his students to become individuals and to express themselves on the guitar in their own way. He is quick to spot a particular gift and to encourage a pupil to develop this ability in the full. David Hewitt himself said, my lessons with Fritz were so inspirational and his enthusiasm so contagious that my transition from popular music to classical seemed the most natural thing for me to do. So he guided me into a world I hadn't known yet existed. Um, so we're saying there are a lot more guitarists than this in South Africa. It's just some of um, Fritz Buss's uh, students. They're still very active today, so all these people are still performing and teaching now, except David. Okay, as a classical guitarist, he also studied with Narciso Yepes. He's a famous um, um, Spanish guitar player, 10-string guitar player. Um, David Hewitt, in 1975, was invited to the International Paris Guitar Festival, um, and he was invited to play at the closing concert. Um, in 1977, he was one of 15 guitarists selected to perform master classes in Lucerne, Barcelona, and Madrid uh, with Narciso Yeps. Also in 1977, Hewitt was sponsored by the Classical Guitar Society of South Africa to give concerts in all major cities throughout South Africa, um, and those sparked Europe and the Americas. So, so that's kind of what kicked him off. Uh, he moved to Durban, so outside of uh, Johannesburg, in 1981 with his wife Wendy, um, where Hewitt himself founded the classical guitar society of KwaZulu Natal. Um, it was there that he performed Rodrigo's Concerto de Aranjuez, that's a famous um, classical guitar tune. Um, and in 1986, he recorded in London for the Meridian label. Um, Hewitt reveled in working with living South African composers. Some of them are listed there. Um, some important ones, David Costner, uh, still, still a well-known composer. He, uh, David Hewitt performed Divergence and Richesta 2A. 
And um, David Hood also performed the premiere of guitar works entitled Five African Sketches by Jean Zidel Rudolph. Um, Dr. Jean Zidel Rudolph is the first woman in South Africa to get a doctorate in composition. Um, and still as of now, so as of 1977, she's the creator of the current national anthem of South Africa. So it's um, pretty neat that David got to play with her. Um, David Hewitt also went on to release his own recordings. Um, and after a long battle with early onset Alzheimer's, he died in 2001. He was only 54, so a little too young. <laughs> uh, this is a picture of David. So this is the mischief maker guy. This is the um, rock and roll star. Um, and then this is his wife, Wendy. And that's Tessa Ziegler, so his duo partner and his wife. That picture was taken shortly before he passed away. It was at a um, fundraising event for him and guitar in South Africa. Um, I'm going to play two more songs. So the first one is Wendy. This is, as we know it, the first classical guitar song he ever wrote. First song he wrote for uh, his wife. And um, The Mischief Maker, which kind of reminds me of the rock and roll guy. So these are two more songs, Wendy and The Mischief Maker. Thank you. 
Western music influence, but I mean like America is Europe, that sort of stuff. Um, South Africa uniquely adopted Western music in its instrumentation quite early in the colonial era of South of Africa. Um, in the early days of Cape Colony, the Kwekwe people were found in playing homemade lutes that they called the Ramki. That's one. Commercially produced European instruments uh, were found to be a little more loud and versatile and durable than indigenous instruments and preferred by the native populations of the time. Guitars worldwide quickly overtook um, the native musical bow instruments, and electric guitar quickly overtook the acoustic one. In Johannesburg in the early 1900s, American ragtime, Dixieland, and jazz became popular. Um, Johannesburg was segregated for sure, but the city's atmosphere allowed for much more cultural exploration and freedom than other settled districts like Cape, Natal, and Transvaal. Um, the most common venue for some of this music to be shared was called a shabim, which means a place to party. So it's kind of like a, a drinking establishment, um, and the title of a piece written and recorded by David Hewitt. Uh, globally, guitarists of the 50s, 60s, and 70s were exposed to a healthy dose of American pop culture and rock music. Um, Western songs and styles took hold of South Africa and were responsible for David Hewitt beginning to play guitar, as was the case for so many guitarists at the time. Elements of popular song form and structure can be discerned all throughout David Hewitt's music, although few of Hewitt's phrases really correspond to the four-bar phrase template common in popular music. Hewitt held a firm grasp of Western harmony in his writing, and clearly prioritized the singability and the catchiness of his melodies. One guitarist, Michael George, wrote of the piece, while each is rooted in traditions of tonal harmony, they are uniquely colorful and melodic. This is for the kind of the theory crew, but um, the first piece I played, the goalie has some kind of blues licks in there. So this flat seven, so making the dominant out of one, because then there'll be like a secondary dominant for four chords. So it's super common in blues music. Um, the blues lick right here is the same situation. These parallel octaves, you're not really allowed to do that in Western harmony, but we do it. Um, and then kind of this blues walking bass line, which is clearly a blues uh, influence in his music. Rock influence, so a lazy bliss, I don't know if you've ever seen that, so it says lazy bliss. Um, and ad lib, everybody's favorite, you kind of make it up as you go. Um, guitars will super recognize this, so power chords or parallel fifths, so this is kind of all over the place in guitar music. It's a gigantic no no in classical writing. Guitar players all know that it's kind of like it sounds awesome, so, so we check that in there. It's all over the place in, in David Hewitt's writing. Uh, this is just a quick phrase writing example, so this is kind of still the Western music influence. Um, this is from the first piece that I played, so Sunrise is the first eight measures. So this is kind of the theme repeated down an octave, and then the actual song starts, so you kind of think of it as like an intro to a pop tune. Um, later on, measure 34 is kind of like the chorus, so that's it's a little less like, you know, European classical, it's a little bit more of a song structure. Okay. What is Mascanda? So Mascanda is a type of Zulu folk music, and the Zulu, by the way, is the largest um, group or nation in South Africa, around 12 million at the moment, but it's a ton of people in South Africa. Um, it's found predominantly in the KwaZulu Natal region of South Africa. That literally means the place of the Zulu. Um, and that's who remembers where David and his wife went and moved in 1981. Muskanda is sometimes referred to as the Zulu blues, um, as performers are kind of storytellers that sing um, about their personal experience in a way similar to the American Delta blues. Um, Muskanda is a rural style of music and it's highly individualistic. It's predominantly played and performed by Zulu males. Uh, for entertainment and self-enjoyment, but it's also um, a form of competition and courtship. So it's, it's very like, personal. It's like a smaller, or it wouldn't be a concert hall. It's very much like kind of your, your friends around you. Um, when the early recording companies in the 1930s went looking to record and market African music, they found these solitary, itinerant young men on, quote, amorous walkabout, singing courtship songs on foot and competing against each other in the manner of a country stick fight. That's a 1930s uh, record producer going to find it. Um, Muscana musicians are highly respected members of their society and are believed to have a very important social role to play. Um, they're afforded a level of criticism of the people and uh, community and aspects of that that otherwise are not permitted outside the context of a song. So some social, social stuff about Muscana is a Zulu folk music. Muscana instruments, so they're all acoustic. Everything's acoustic for Muscana music. Um, 
You'll see instruments like concertina, so that's like a tiny organ, a small <coughs> organ, violin, but definitely the most common one is guitar, without a doubt. Um, the origins of this instrumentation are born from the musical bow, specifically gourd bow instruments. Um, and those are kind of a distinguishing feature of Southern African music in general. So like a bow instrument rather than like a kalimba, and vira, marimba, that sort of stuff. Bows are really big in, in Southern Africa. Um, the Zulu gourd, gourd bow instrument is called the umakweana. Um, and these instruments allow for the percussive polyphony for traditional um, Muscanda music. Um, eventually adopted by guitar playing, you can do multiple things at once. Um, the key for any of these instruments is that you're, you can't use wind instruments or like mouth bow instruments, because <coughs> your voice needs to be free to sing. So at the end of the day, you've got to sing a song here. Um, it's not only wind instruments, and particularly with Stan, that's very much about kind of like um, singing songs. This is also from kind of the music nerds, but um, this is the song structure common to Muscanda. So it starts with an intella, so an unetered musical introduction, uh, a fixed chorus, so we recognize that in, the, in a pop tune as well, um, the solo vocal section, so that enters after a few repetitions of the chorus, and then optionally it's called the itzibongo, or the praises, so you can think of it as like a, a solo section or an improvisatory section. Um, very okay, sweet. I just want to say about this, super key about this, is that there's a three against two pattern. So that's, we could say, uncommon in Western music. So three against two. So this is divided into three eighth notes. This is divided into two eighth notes. And that interplay is all over the place in David Hewitt's music and African music in general, right? So it's subdividing the beat, not in just two or four or eight other subdivisions. So three is pretty common. Five will give you a time. Nine will give you a time. But so weird, weirder uh, divisions of the beat. Okay. Muscana guitar. So a Muscana musician, musician refers to himself or herself as someone who plays a Zulu guitar. Those who play another way are not considered Muscanda. Um, the instruments themselves are regarded as indigenous by the performers, um, as became the case in many parts of Africa um, after the introduction of European instruments. So by referring to it as a Zulu guitar, they're distinguishing from other styles of music. So a Zulu guitar is not a Western guitar. Um, Zulu guitar and guitar in general is a polyphonic instrument, so that means multiple lines can be played at the same time. That becomes kind of important for that three against two situation. So having multiple lines being able to be played on one instrument, it takes out the need for like three musicians or two musicians. You can kind of narrow it down to even one playing multiple rhythms, multiple lines, and singing at the same time. Um, not unlike a uh, guitar that, that we might know about uh, in America. This is Zulu guitar tuning. So guitars will recognize this much anyway. So low E, A, D, G, B, and then high D. That's a little bit weird. So they tune the highest note down to D. Uh, I regret to say I also play a little banjo, and that's the same tuning as banjo. So it's kind of worth saying that's a West African instrument. So there might be something going on there. I don't know exactly, but tuning it down to D makes it a little bit easier to make it like major chords, kind of a happier situation. Guitar, like Spanish guitar, tends to be kind of like sadder and more somber. So putting it to D makes it a little bit easier to, to stay happy. Um, something interesting that they do, so guitarists in classical idioms and acoustic idioms, the low six, the low four strings, to the low three strings, uh, are played with your thumb. So it's kind of like the bass player in the band. The top three strings are played with your fingers. So that's how they set up guitar in the original way. So hopefully we pick and everything now, but. Um, originally, that's what they were thinking. Uh, the Zulu and the Skanda musicians divide it further, so it's gendered. So the high notes are um, women's voices, the Amantambazan, and the bass voices are the Amadol or the men's voices. That's actually very important to them because the, the singers would be male or female. Um, <coughs> these are just some kind of examples of this three against two situation. So, to write this in Western music notation, they just kind of put a bunch of triplets. You might notice that there's two voices, so there's divisions of three and then divisions of two. So this is feeling of three against two, kind of all throughout. Notated in Western notation, um, David here at the test is even just put triplets.
Okay, blending the gap, so Western and African, the Zulu blended pop culture. The 1980s saw an explosion of musicians and styles in South Africa, signaling the emergence of a distinct South African popular culture to the world. Uh, the late 80s and early 90s saw a spike in attention to South Africa in general for the end of apartheid, right? So um, the world was watching South Africa in a big way in those two decades. Johnny Clegg was called South Africa's white Zulu and a prominent figure to the resistance of apartheid. Um, he reached commercial success with um, mixing Zulu, Zulu and English lyrics, combining both those idioms. Um, South African broadcasting banned his recording saying that Clegg was uh, insulting the Zulu people by claiming um, their music. And the Zulu people, so the Zulu monarch, uh, appointed him a royal minstrel. So he was kind of this figure of, uh, of a tension between the Zulu and kind of the colonizers. Um, I dig into this a little bit more in my paper, if you're kind of interested in that. There's clearly a conversation to be had about appropriation and that sort of stuff. Um, there are strong arguments for both sides. It's worth saying that the Zulu were kind of stoked about it. They kind of liked that he was, um, that he learned their language and learned their dancing and all the rest of it. So he's a very controversial figure in, in South Africa. Um, Johnny Clegg also was um, Americanly successful, so he played uh, in Rain Man, so the, the song for the movie Rain Man. Disney's George of the Jungle with Brendan Fraser, he's in that. Um, the song Dela, if I play it, you recognize it, but Google it. Uh, Fern Gully, Whispers, Career Opportunities, um, Opportunity Knocks with Dana Carvey, he's a comedian. Um, and this is kind of timely, this is weird too. So uh, his song Great Heart was recorded by Jimmy Buffett in the 90s, so interesting stuff. The um, reason we say all this is Johnny Clay was very much a musical contemporary of David Hewitt. So David Hewitt was very clearly trying to like ride this wave, this like cultural wave. He wanted to you know, write and record music in a way that would be popular in South Africa and kind of beyond. So the 80s and 90s, ends of apartheid, a lot of kind of pop culture emphasis um, in South Africa, so David was trying to ride that wave. Okay, so that's his compositional patchwork. He's got Western rock and pop. Um, he's got classical, and he's got Zulu Masanda going on. Um, a quote in his uh, album says, surrounded from a young age by the crosswinds of African and Western culture, it was natural that David's works would reflect both his classical training and influences of the land in which he lives. Two more songs. So I'm gonna play slow training, it's like a kind of like a blues situation. And then street beat, uh, it's about Johannesburg.
all have a second guitar part intended for Tessa. So there's there's another part that kind of goes with it. So if you're interested in this stuff, Spotify and check it out on um, um, YouTube. There's a, like a really big kind of arrangement to some of these things, um, but they work just as well as a solo piece. Um, and one more piece, Shing Wenzi, is the only one that's duo only. Um, okay. Uh, as a recording artist and working musician, so Hewitt um, performed and recorded South African composers. We mentioned all of them earlier. Um, David Hewitt's work um, with record producer David Gresham, um, who was a strong voice in the pop music industry. Um, he was the South African broadcasting like TV show, so, so kind of on this like line of him trying to be a pop star a little bit. Um, he met in the radio show Top 20 and then SAB's T C TV's Pop Shop. Um, that's all in his like um, record deal, or how he met his record deal. Um, it's clear that David Hewitt's ambitions were to record his classical guitar pieces in a way that would garner the attention of a very broad audience. Some of his recording bandmates. So Victor Masunda is a jazz bassist and vocalist. Takozo Zungu is an electric guitarist. These are all on David Hewitt albums. Dizu Platjes, that guy's a big deal. He's a percussionist and the founder of the group Amon Pando. They're still playing now, so Dizu Platjes is a, is a figure in, in uh, South African music. Isaac Machali is the drummer of the group Bayate. He's also in the David Hewitt program. Um, and also, this is kind of interesting, Paul Simon's bracing him. You guys are familiar with that album. He's the drummer on that. So he still tours with Paul Simon. So interesting times in the, in the 80s and 90s in South Africa. OK, Grace Sambo. So David Rebel, Rebel particularly in his collaboration with her. Um, it's the Holy Jerusalem Choir of East Rand, which is in the neighborhood of uh, Johannesburg. Um, the choir's founder is Grace Sambo. Uh, she founded the group in 1986. Uh, both David and Grace have since passed. Um, they're still playing under the name Domba La Africa. This is them. So they're, they're still performing and recording now. Um, David undoubtedly took inspiration from the many musicians he collaborated with, um, but Grace is probably uh, one of the most significant, and she's the only one listed as a co author in any of his pieces. So uh, she's on, uh, she's listed in Song of Hope. Um, Song of Hope is recorded as a full choir arrangement, um, and it's very difficult to hear the guitar part in it. So when you have a full blown choir, like a solo acoustic guitar, is going to get a little bit buried. Um, I'll play it a little bit in a second. Um, the recording begins with a soft chance and the male voice parts, so I outline the one, four, five harmonies. So there are people who know that, the one, four, five harmonies, um, followed by the female vocal parts with the anticipation of the counter melody, and then finally the male tenors um, with our first hearing of the theme. This three-part unfolding of voices makes perfect sense in the three-part vocal structure of, um, of Masanda music. Um, finally, the theme comes in presented by the guitar, but it's overwhelmed by the theme sung in the voices. Uh, but there is a, a solo guitar section. I'm going to play this on my phone because I'm not the most tech savvy person. You can just listen close. I'll play it half, half of the Kind of the gist of it. Um, you guys will be familiar with choir music being really important in South Africa, so they have their own whole tradition about that. Again, really made clear in apartheid, but huge tradition for, for choir music. Um, the solo guitar score, so he took that and made the solo guitar score. Um, here marked espressivo, so this kind of is dealing with it in the way that a Moscana musician would. So espressivo, in my eyes, means there's no rhythm at all. So maybe 4-4, four, four, you know, could be something like that, but very free, so it could be the Intel, right? It could be just a totally free, expressive, whatever intro you want to do. Um, it could be unmetered. Um, 
the solo guitar score is also thinking like a Zulu guitar, so there's two separate parts. This might be the male or the amadola, this might be the amatambazan, and they're split um, three against two. Right? It's not a perfect, perfect pattern of it, but it's thinking in, the, in those terms for sure. Uh, cool, might as well play this. This is the image of his last uh, album. So this is likely Grace Sambo. This is KwaZulu Natal where he um, uh, retired. Johannesburg, uh, a Zulu guitar, and a sunrise. So that's all on the album. So all those pieces are included in that. That's actually um, woven. That's so an actual tapestry. Okay, song of woven. It's gonna sound a little like this, but not exactly. This summer I'm going to South Africa, so we're going to go on tour and talk to all these people and, and go to Wits University, talk to Tessa, all those, all those people listed, we're, we're saying hey to all them, so hopefully, hopefully we do it this year. Would you say South African guitar is more percussive than like the traditional classical? Uh, yeah, than traditional classical for sure, no doubt about it. I add a little sauce in there too, so maybe if I'm like smacking the string, but just trying to make it clear. 
not just for us, but for me mostly. But yeah, more percussive. One thing's for sure is guitar can kind of do anything, right? So you can be percussive. You don't have to, like, you don't have to treat classical guitar like a, like, you know, delicate. They're, they can take it. They can take the hit. So, really, that German percussive bus up. Fritz bus. Yeah. And and played for Segovia. So how did the the folk side the Sulu music and all this get integrated into into so the more formal circles? So it I guess it really didn't. So David knew it in that way was sort of I'll tell I should tell you the story, but I'll tell Fritz I said it, but I contacted Fritz and he kinda laughed. <laughs> so I said, Hey, I'm doing this like paper, I'm gonna write this thing on, on David Hewitt. And he's like, David would think that's hilarious. Because David his whole life thought of himself more as like a pop writer or like kind of a rock, rock kind of guy. Um, I would say it didn't really, it, it hasn't really integrated that well, right? So kind of on both sides, like that people maybe don't want to, to do both. Or, or it's, it's hard to integrate the two. So the university side of things was very much like classical oriented and then after university who was, who David was Adamant to include everyone. And, and, and when you proposed this for your thesis, effectively, was there any problem with the American academic accepting uh, this as, as noble enough? To totally. Do? Yes, is the short answer. The long answer is it's anytime you can add to the repertoire. This was unknown, so it, it was seen as adding to the American repertoire. So it was a net win, right? So it, was, it adds to stuff that people can play. Um, I've assigned this to students and stuff. Like, I, I definitely, I think it's good music, right? And it's also accessible. Like, you're not doing, like, like you're forgiven if you don't want to hear Beethoven for half an hour on guitar. You know, like, it's, like, okay to, like, shorten it and make it kind of accessible and fun, you know? So, there, yeah, there was some resistance, but it was mostly, mostly okay. Yeah? When you use a term acoustic, what do you mean? Uh, so, no, no, no electronic amplification of any kind. So using only the sound waves in the air, pushing around the air to, to make the sound. So anytime you're, all instruments before electronics or acoustic, clearly, but if you have, like if I amplify it, would you like electric guitar, that's, you know, no longer acoustic. You could argue with the, the sound guys, we'd argue all day, so acoustics in general is just how uh, sound interacts with, with air to us. So acoustics is no electronics. Are there other channels for his music to be disseminated out outside of South Africa, other than your students on having your assignments? <laughs> uh, for sure. I mean, I would say recording is kind of a, not just for David Hewitt, but anybody. So recording sort of in the last hundred years is like a phenomenal way to, to reach across borders. Right back in the day, you had to like either play the song yourself or go and hear the person play it. So the short answer is recording, right? You get in kind of sticky waters with recording for anything um, younger than 75 years old, because David Hewitt would take issue with that, right? So it's copyrighted, and his family owns that copyright. So you can't just like throw it around, you know? So I've gotten permission, but Beethoven you can go for, right? I, th I think the copyright law is 75 years old, or it's, it's free reign. What I mean is like, he's, you know, you said he was formerly unknown in the United States. Now you wrote a thesis work, you're giving performances, you're teaching your students, art, is there, you know, how do you create a market for his recordings in the United States? I don't know, the market thing, man, that's why I got into music. I don't know the market thing at all. So, so I do know that, that sharing it as many places as you can is kind of the best way to go. I will say that there was, so during apartheid, it, it wasn't like an accident, like there was an academic embargo. Like all of South Africa, I didn't know this before starting that paper, by the way, you couldn't like you couldn't communicate with South Africa. You couldn't access their publications. They weren't recognized. Like none of that stuff was like you know um, kosher for American or European or like academic the academic world. Really starting in the 2000s, that's, that got done. So this is right in the middle of that embargo. Totally. Yes. So <laughs> yeah, for sure. It was a boycott. Yeah, boycott. Yeah, exactly. So. Yeah, you know, a point of contention, obviously, globally. Maybe one more we'll go for, and then I'm gonna stay, I'm gonna hang out after. So did Zulu guitarists are they using 
steel string guitars, or are they using you know, nylon based? Uh -huh. They were using whatever they could get, but steel string, just in general, not just Zulu guitars, but really worldwide, that's a, really a better option for a lot of people. It just travels better, it's a lot more durable, it's a lot louder, yeah. right? Classical guitarists are kind of going back in time a little bit. Like, we used to use gut strings and now nylon. It's kind of standard. I'm using carbon strings. So it's kind of like, there's an emphasis on like, on expression in classical guitar where loudness sort of wins everywhere else. I don't know if that makes sense. Like, there's, there's opportunity for dynamics on classical guitars that isn't on acoustic guitars. So Do they often use like, tools like, tools like the capo, like you were using? Uh, no, they would just tune it. They would just tune it. Or, you know, it's worth saying that, so the third fret, that is the loop tuning. So when you take a guitar and you put a tape on the third fret, you're playing the loop. So that's a kind of a hack for, like, we, that accesses a lot of music before guitar. So, But I would say they would steel strings, tune to whatever they got. Right, it doesn't, it's not necessarily totally standardized. Right? Like, so, like, like a lot of American folk music, in general, where, like, you know, like, you're got these, you know, Yeah, I, I think there's a pretty strong parallel there. Like, American blues music, folk music, in the, like, 1800s, you know, it was an unhappy time, we could say, right? It was, it was born out of a, of a different need, right? It wasn't for concert halls, it was much more of a personal need. A different commentary, too. Yeah, totally. Okay, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate you listening. If you guys want any more information on this, email me, begs r, r begs at middlesex.nice.edu, or just see me afterwards. I'm, I'm around. Thank you guys for listening.